Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 189th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Taylor Schulte. Taylor is the founder of Define Financial, an independent REA based in San Diego that oversees 76 million of assets under management for 60 families in or approaching retirement. What's unique about Taylor, though, is the way he's grown his practice by proactively spending on marketing from hiring a branding and website design agency to a PR firm to running ongoing advisor marketing experiments and everything from local SEO to email marketing automation. In this episode, we talk in depth about both the hits and the misses in marketing that Taylor has experienced along the way, from the initial $12,000 spend he invested into his original website that in retrospect wasn't focused enough to succeed, to the $24,000 he spent on a PR firm that was deemed valuable, but not something he continued. How Taylor figured out how to turn podcast listeners into clients, but only after three years of trying. And the way all his marketing results accelerated once he decided to narrow to a more focused target clientele to pursue, even though it meant firing his mother and his grandfather from being clients. Such that today, 75% of all of Taylor's new clients first reach out to him through his well-targeted website that speaks to his niche clientele. We also talk about Taylor's own evolution within the business, how he hit the wall at $250,000 of revenue and got stuck and able to grow further, not because of his marketing, but his operations limitations, the way he got through the blocking point by hiring an office manager to take over and focus on those operational aspects, the unique hiring process that Taylor used to find the ideal office manager, and the journal that Taylor now keeps to monitor what he should be doing and what he needs to start delegating. And be certain to listen to the end, where Taylor shares how working with business coaches have helped him break through the key blocking points in his business, how he's come to rely on CRM workflows, even though Taylor, in his own words, is not operations-minded, and why Taylor's biggest regret is that he didn't focus on his niche clientele earlier, even as he recognizes that struggling without a niche focus for several years may have been the only way he could eventually accept why getting more focused would help the way that it has. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Taylor Schulte. Welcome, Taylor Schulte, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Michael, happy Friday. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to have you on board with the podcast today and and talking some advisor marketing. I, you know, I, I feel like marketing is always kind of an ever-present theme for us in advisor world. You know, so much of the advisor world basically comes down to either get clients, find clients, your only chance is to get more clients, or if you want to move up in your career, you gotta figure out how to get clients, like this, this sort of dominant theme of at some point in most of our careers, the pressure is there to figure out how to get clients and bring them in sometimes out of the gate in our careers. And I I know you, you've kind of lived this varied advisor marketing world. You run a cool podcast called experiments in advisor marketing. You, You live this in your advisory firm and doing a lot of marketing experiments. I, I feel like a lot of it has only become all the more relevant in the world of coronavirus pandemic. And a lot of our, called our, our traditional, advisor marketing approaches, which frankly, me aren't always even necessarily all that marketing. It's just sort of like brute force. Go out and meet a lot of people and talk to a lot of people and play the game of numbers. And at some point, a few of them will probably turn out to be clients. A lot of that is broken down now. And and I feel like it's really pushing us in the direction of saying, we have to actually build and create a more formalized marketing structure around our firms, parentheses, that can work even if we can't go out and do all that in-person networking we did once before. And so few of us really, I think, have much experience with that, but you've you've lived it for a lot of years now. And so again, I'm just excited to talk on like on the ground hand combat advisor marketing. How do you get this done? 
Yeah, well, fortunately, I, I I really love this stuff. Like, I have just a true passion for marketing. You know, when some people are spending their Friday nights binging Netflix, you know, I'll be reading nerdy marketing articles and digging into SEO, working on our websites and our processes. So, like, I truly love this stuff, which makes it you know a lot of fun for me. And in turn, we have a lot of success with it. Well, very cool. So, I'm I I think to to get started, I'd love to just give everyone a bit of an understanding of your advisory firm, the business as it exists today. Like, what do you do? Who do you do it for? What's the what's the size of the practice? How long have you been running it? Like, just paint a picture for us of the business as it exists today, and then we can talk more about like what have you built? How did you get there? What did what did this uh, marketing process look like to get to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So we're a, a fee-only financial planning firm. We're headquartered out here in sunny San Diego. We specialize in working with people over the age of 50 who are focused on retirement planning and tax planning. We work with about 60 families. Most of the families we work with are here in Southern California, but we do have some families scattered around the United States. Our AUM, our, our, the assets that we manage are about 76 million these days. We have a team of three, myself, uh, a lead financial planner, and an office manager. Yeah, that's about what we look like today. Okay. And and so how long have you been on this journey of the firm? Because uh, I know you've, you've had a few changes in, in uh, firms that you work with over the years. We'll, we'll probably talk about that a little bit later. But kind of building the 76 million, like how long has that building process been for you? <laughs> yeah, well, almost 13 years now, or or just over 13 years. I, my career path is very fairly similar to a lot of people. I got a, a job at a big wirehouse right out of school at age 22. I was thrown into the fire in 2007, and you know just started kind of growing my practice there. Like you said, I, I bounced around to a couple different firms, and ultimately, I started my firm in 2014. And since starting this firm in 2014, we've more than tripled in, in size since then. So it's been a lot of fun to have control over, uh, you know, how we how we grow, the types of clients we work with, getting really creative in our in our marketing. Um, and so, yeah, we, we can dig into as much as you want there. So I'm just trying to kind of get a handle on sort of just growth trajectory, what it looks like, like. Just the whole nature of growth, I know, means different things for different advisors. For for some, like, hey, I've got no pretty good place in my career. Like, if I get one or two new clients this year, like, I'm feeling good. Others, are like, no, I need one or two clients a month in order to keep my pace going. So, talk to us a little bit more about what the what the growth trajectory and path has looked like for you over the past, I guess, f- five or six years since breaking out on your own into the firm, and then and then I want to you know start understanding a little bit more, like. What if what have you tried to get there? Like seventy six million is a fantastic number when you're when you're working on your own with a team of three. A lot of advisors take twenty plus years to get there. So I want to understand more about what you've done to get there, but just help us understand what this trajectory has been over the past five or six years. Sure. So when I launched the firm in, in two thousand fourteen, you know I might have had around, uh, or I know I had around one hundred and sixty thousand dollars in you know in annual revenue. We started to ramp up, uh, started to, again, explore some different marketing paths to grow the firm. You know, you mentioned one or two clients a year, like what what the goal was in, in you know, client acquisition. My goal has always been, you know, five to 10 really rock solid clients each year. Some years is more, some years is less. And we can also talk about in the middle of kind of this growth tra- trajectory, I hit one of these, what you might call growth barriers. I just kind of really stuck in like 2016, 2017 where our revenue was sitting around 250,000. I just like couldn't couldn't get over this hump. And so yeah, so we've grown again since then. This year we'll do, you know, 500,000 or or more in, in revenue. And like you said, we've just experimented with a lot of different things. I've I've had to go backwards a few times before going forwards again. And so yeah, it's been a really really interesting journey. So talk to us then about some of what what you've done in the in the marketing world, you know, to go from 160k of revenue in 2014 uh, to 3xing that five years later is a a huge growth path unto itself. Particularly, I think the you know the pressure we feel in solo advisor world or like you're 
you know, chief cook and bottle washer all at the same time, or like advise the clients and run the business and deal with compliance and the audits. Oh, and do the marketing and the sales and the client servicing and all the rest. So like maybe we can get large enough to get an office manager or someone to help, which I know you've gotten to now, but I'm imagining did not have when you were, when you were getting started and had to, had to do this building stage. So what is, what is marketing looked like for this growth cycle? Yeah. So right out of the gates there in 2014, and this is something that I picked up from you. I think you wrote an article in 2012 or 2013, and you've since repeated it, but you made this comment that the average advisory firm only spends about 2% of gross revenue on marketing activities. I remember reading that and you're like, that's crazy when you know your average small business spends, I don't know, 5, 10, 15% of their gross revenue on marketing. And so, you know, I, I was very fortunate at the time. I didn't have kids. I was married. My wife was still working. I like to just highlight here before we go any further, like I wouldn't have been able to do what I did over the last six years if it wasn't for my wife working and supporting my goals and building this firm, because I was able to, unlike most advisory firms, I was able to reinvest a large chunk of our revenue back into the firm and, and help fuel growth. And one of the things out of the gates, and this isn't really the case anymore, but back in 2014, most advisor websites just sucked. Like they were just terrible, right? And so it was just this low hanging fruit where I could actually spend a little bit of money to design a better looking website, just to kind of initially stand out from my competition and just look a little bit different. So when somebody landed on my website and they were looking at a few other advisors, just looked and felt a little bit different. And I was able just to easily stand out back then with just a really good looking website. So that was one thing. And then the other was just having online visibility. Unlike, you know, we have some clients that are personal injury attorneys and they have to spend $30,000 per month in Google paid ads just to stand out online and get visibility because there's so much competition in that space. But for us, you know, San Diego is a highly competitive city. We have great firms. I sit smack in the middle of like two giant multi-billion dollar RIAs, but they don't really spend any money online to gain that visibility, which means just organically, just putting some effort and just like basic organic, you know, digital marketing strategies. I was able to become very, very visible in a very large competitive city pretty quickly without spending a whole lot of money. I spent a lot of my money on just education and teaching myself these things rather than outsourcing a lot of it, just because again, I have this inherent passion for marketing. So yeah, that was kind of twofold there, just kind of building the online presence, building a website that really stood out and then kind of, yeah, just going from there. The, the other kind of big growth spurt that we're just seeing right now, kind of after I was able to get over that, that growth barrier was getting really focused on exactly who we work with and, and who we do our best work with. That's just something that, that I've seen really work well. And, and in turn, it makes our marketing really easy when we only work with one single demographic, all of our clients look the same, but that was the other kind of big shift that we made. It was really, really, really hard. And I recognize in, in talking to so many advisors, how challenging that is. You know, I mentioned, I, I grew up in the wirehouse world. My clients coming out of the wirehouse were they, they all look different. They're all over the place. They had all different looking portfolios. I serviced them all differently. I was driving to their houses around town. Like it was a mess. So to get from there to where I'm at today has certainly taken a lot of work, but being able to just get really narrow and get really clear about who we do our best work with is working very, very well from a marketing perspective these days. All right. So I've got a lot of questions there, but, but I, I actually just want to start for a moment with the the last point that you made around around focusing in clients and, and kind of this distinction between what you're doing now, like we work with those over age 50 who are gearing up for retirement, they need retirement and tax planning advice, and like that's who we work with versus what it was like in the in the large firm world of having lots of different clients all over the place, you know, sort of liter maybe literally geographically and just in terms of their life stage, their careers, their business needs, their advice needs, which I feel like gets amplified in the traditional way we get brought into the business. Like, here's a suite of products. Anybody you can find is willing to buy any of these things from you as a prospect. And, and like the bigger the product quiver we get, the wider range of clients that we end up getting versus this more focused approach that you've taken of saying, well, I just want to go after one particular group because it makes my marketing easier and so much more focused when I'm I'm just going after one group and trying to be awesome at them. So I'm I guess I'm the first thing I'm wondering is just 
like what led you to make that transition? Did you literally come at it from a marketing end of saying, geez, I just got to pick one of these or I can't figure out how to market to all of them? Or was there some other trigger for you to say, even though I've done it this way and I've accumulated a good size client base and several hundred thousand dollars of revenue, I can't keep going unless I take fewer of these and get more focused. Yeah, it's a good question. So interestingly enough, I, I didn't come at it from a marketing angle. Like I just, I never was able to wrap my head around getting really narrow and niching down, being able to help and make my marketing easier. It seems so obvious now, but that, that's just not what happened. Again, in that like 2016, 2017, like I was just stuck. I didn't know what to do. I remember telling my wife, like, I can't take on another client. I'm pulling my hair out over here. And she's like, you're taking on more clients. Like you can't just stop here. And so fortunately I stumbled across Matthew Jarvis and Stephanie Bogan right around that time. I was in the first cohort for the Limitless Advisor uh, coaching program. And that gave me just this newfound clarity of just one kind of acknowledging where I was at and why I was stuck. And then kind of coaching me through that process and teaching me, hey, if, if this is your goal, you know, my goal is to get to 100 million uh, as quick as possible. If that's your goal, you know, here's, here's a formula for success in, in order to do that. And just really kind of opened my eyes to kind of the why behind uh, getting really specific about who we do our best work with. And then more importantly, creating these systems and processes to, to properly service that, that target market, you know, add a ton of value and just create a really good service model that allowed us to, to scale and grow. And then kind of once I got to the other side of that, and we can talk through the really, really challenging conversations that I had to have with clients that weren't really a good fit. But once I got to the other side of that, it just kind of hit me. I'm like, this makes my marketing so much easier. When you go to my homepage of my website now, and it says, we help people over the age of 50 plan for retirement. Like if you're under the age of 50, you're just, you're in the wrong place. And so nowadays the people that come to us and schedule phone calls to our website, like they are a, a very, very, very good fit. It just makes everything so much easier. So help me understand more as you like hit this wall in 2016, 2017, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of revenue, but it's flatlining. I don't have any more capacity. I can't take any more of this. And, and your wife informed you that stopping wasn't an option. So like, I, I mean, what, what changed, like what, what changed or what had to change in, in your business or in your mindset? Like what, what shifted? What, what was making you stuck that then made you unstuck once you had this aha moment? Well, like a lot of advisors, you know, I never really had fully adopted a CRM system. I didn't have workflows. I didn't have processes. I don't have an operations mindset. Like I suck at that stuff. And so that was a big part of all this. But you know, the, the analogy that I often use, I, I play a lot of golf. And uh, when you try to get better at golf and you take lessons, you'll often get worse before you get better. And that's kind of what had to happen. My, I had to go backwards before I could go forwards again. And so there was a lot of cleaning up of the practice and kind of going backwards again, transitioning clients that weren't really a good fit, identifying who truly was a good fit, creating a, a service model, creating workflows and processes in order to service them properly and, and add value. And she's so kind of going through this whole reorganization of the firm. And then the big one for me was taking the leap and, and hiring an office manager. Historically, I've been so bad at, at delegating. I'm your traditional, you know, I want to do everything. Nobody can do it as good as me. And just kind of letting go of some of these things. And so just the reorganization, going backwards, transitioning out clients, getting really focused, hiring an office manager, and finally learning how to delegate all those things coupled with, again, you know, niching down and getting really narrow really helped me get over that hump. And it just seems so clear and easy now, but I know I talk to advisors all the time and how challenging it is when you're in that place. And, you know, I used all the same excuses I hear from other advisors, which is like, well, I love working with everybody, you know, such and such client doesn't really take up much of my time. Like, you know, I was saying all those things, but all those things were the reason why I wasn't able to grow and get over that, that hump. So it was just about 18 months of, you know, hitting pause, going backwards, having some really, really challenging conversations, making some really hard decisions, um, having, you know, some really good coaches on my side coaching me through it. And, you know, everything just seems so clear now. And today we're just a well-oiled machine and, and ready to rock. So, so help me understand more of the, like the hard decisions that you were, that you were facing. What, what were you working on that 
focus like had to change or was hard to change or you couldn't decide if you wanted to change that's what made it a hard decision well i think i think the hardest was you know the clients right you know i, I again I, I started as an advisor at age 22 you know i had my my parents as as clients my grandparents i had my you know uh, like other friends my, like any my, good wirehouse recruit you brought your natural market list oh yeah yeah i started with mom's rolodex and worked through that and so that my biggest fear in this was these people who have trusted me for a really long time and you know working out a plan to to transition them in order to free up the capacity to kind of, you know, take the firm where I wanted to go. So, I mean, I literally had to go through a process of firing my own mother and firing my grandfather and firing my mother. in laws like, Did you literally have to fire your parents from the firm? I, I did not both of my parents, but I did. I, you know, I had to go through a process of transitioning out my, my own grandfather, who was one of my first clients back in, in 2007. So it was those just really hard conversations. Like I just hate letting people down and so just that process was just a huge hurdle for me to get over. And so that was probably the hardest decision. It's also really hard to hire uh, and find the right person. Again, just I have a hard time delegating and letting go of things. I also have a hard time spending a lot of money on payroll. And so that was a really big decision in hiring Karen and bringing her on board it was a year and a half ago now. But again, having really good coaches on my side and coaching me through that process. Like there's no way I could operate today without Karen. Like she is the glue of our firm, but that was a big decision for me, you know, to go and put that on our payroll was a big one. So first of all, I'm like, just to be clear, what, why, why did mom have to be fired? Or I guess more generally, like why, why did you have to fire this base of, of early clients? I mean, was this like just, Clients not sizable enough to service in your firm, people who weren't a fit for this, I want to focus on retirees over age 50. Why did you have to do all these client transitions? Yeah. So we, we drew a line in the sand. Again, as hard as that is, we drew a line in the sand. I said, we're going to focus on people over the age of 50, focus on retirement planning, million dollars or more, You know, set a minimum fee of, of $7,500 per year. And yeah, and so everyone who didn't fall into that, you know, we had some awesome young professional clients that were in their 30s and 40s, some of which had millions of dollars and were fantastic people and fantastic clients that just didn't fit. And again, those are really hard conversations to have, but I learned and I'm doing a disservice to those clients. Like the the, the needs and goals of a 30-year-old, a millionaire 30-year-old are wildly different than, you know, a 60-year-old gearing up for retirement. We just couldn't do it all. So the the folks that even, I had even at even at people that have you know a million plus dollars and are paying you many thousands of dollars of fees. Totally. They have a totally different set of needs goals. And, you know, my 30 year old millionaire clients are, you know, buying companies, selling companies. They're, they're, you know, moving across the country. They're moving out of the country. They're getting married. Like there's so many life changes happening. It's just, you can't, you know, it's just not who we were doing our best work with. And again, just wildly different needs and goals than somebody in their fifties and sixties. And so I just kind of had to make this decision, this, this business decision. And at the time, I'd say about a third of our clients were these high earning young professionals, your, your Henry's and two thirds were your retiree baby boomer type clients. And so I just kind of had to take a hard look at the practice and decide who do I really do my best work with? Who do I enjoy working with? I'm kind of an old soul. I've always just worked really well with an older demographic. I was always that, that young guy that's in the corner at, at my parents' party talking to the friend, their friends. And just, I always just really enjoyed those conversations. And so yeah, as hard as it was, I just had some really challenging conversations with those people. In the end, it actually all worked out very, very well. They weren't as challenging as I had thought. I went through a really you know, detailed process. I didn't just kick them to the curb or anything like that. I actually transitioned most of them to another firm here in town that strictly works with that demographic. And in the end, I think we're all in a better place. Like They're getting better service. They're, they have an advisor that specializes in their exact demographic, and I'm able to get really focused on who we work with. And, and out of curiosity, did you just like literally w walk away from them and refer them out? Did you actually do this as like a partial business sale and, and, and sell off a portion of the client base? Like how did you transition away from what it sounds like was a, 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 a non-trivial amount of actual revenue on the table, particularly as you're staring down hiring and payroll? Yeah. So a, a few of these clients were very, very good clients, very profitable clients and fit a certain demographic. And for those clients, we did, we did sell them to another firm in town. It really wasn't about the, the money for me necessarily, but I wanted to make sure that they got in good hands. And just the other firm that I'd spoken to, we just kind of 
you know, agreed that this is the way we'd go about that process. But it really was only, I don't know, three or four households that we did that with. Most of them, we just kind of went through this process of identifying what their needs were, who was a good fit. For some of them, it was just, you know, going to uh, retail and kind of self-managing their accounts. But for others, we just provided kind of a list of a few different advisors that they might consider helping them make that transition and kept it really simple and easy. And, and all of this basically drove around the idea of the reason I've hit this wall at 250,000 of revenue is there's just too many different clients that have too many different needs at once. The only way I'm going to get my head above water again is I got to just pick one, one type I'm going to be awesome at because then I can do the same consistent thing and this will make my life easier. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I think that you summarized it really well. And then talk to me about the the hiring end of this. You see, like the you know, the other challenge was I'm I'm not one for delegating. I don't like taking on payroll, but but you did. So what what changed? What led to that change or transition? How did you get over that that hump that is, I think, still a challenge for a lot of us? Yeah, I guess just just knowing that if I wanted to reach certain goals, we were going to need somebody you know in the firm to help with certain things. And I guess I was just learning that you know, taking note of the things that I'm really good at and that I enjoy doing and how can I spend more of my time doing those things each and every day, there was just no other way around it other than to delegate. Like, you know, me answering the phones all day and processing paperwork and applications and opening new accounts and dealing with our service team while also managing portfolios for clients and doing all the financial planning. Like, it's just a lot. You just get to this point where you cannot do it all. I know you've you've talked about this and I, I try to talk about it more with advisors just because I don't think it's talked about enough, but there's a giant difference between being a financial planner all day long and being a CEO. And you can do both for a certain amount of time, but then you just kind of come to this crossroads where you're just going to be pulling your hair out and you're going to be working, you know, 15 hours a day, or you're just going to get stuck and you're not going to be able to grow. And so once I was just kind of brought to the surface for me, again, mostly through the Limitless Advisor program with Matt and Stephanie, it was just kind of a no brainer uh, to make that move. I will say, you know, developing a hiring process is one of the things that really helped for me. And I'll just share something that worked really well for us. If anybody's out there looking to hire, whether it's a, a financial planner or a, a, an admin role, but we created a job description. I'm, I'm happy to share it, Michael, if you want to share it with everybody, but we created much, much like my website back in 2014, when everybody else's websites looked terrible. And I, you know, created one that looked very, very nice. Uh, we did the same thing with our job description. It, it, we put a lot of time and effort into making it look really nice, really different, really stand out from every other job description you've ever seen. And then marketing that job description much differently than you might think. So instead of posting it on, I don't even know what you post it on these days, Indeed or Monster or LinkedIn or whatever, we didn't, we skipped all of that. And we actually put the job description on Nextdoor. Nextdoor is that social media app for all the different right. neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah, for um, neighborhoods. Yeah. And okay. so we, we kind of wrote a, a post and posted the description or posted the job description as a PDF on Nextdoor. We had some people that we know share it in some different neighborhoods around San Diego. And that's how we found Karen. She wasn't even looking for a job. She worked for a, a competitor and she saw it and it jumped out to her. A friend of hers shared it with her and you know, we, we got matched up and it was perfect. So a nice little little trick there. I think next door is just an underutilized place if you're if you're in the market for hiring. Very cool. Out of curiosity, like do you do you still have the job description around? Are you willing to share it? I think yeah, yeah. some people are just curious, like what is a what is a like unique PDF? job description look like? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I'll, I'll share it with you. I have the PDF still. I share it with people all the time. In addition to the basics of like, you know, here's the job description and uh, the amount that the benefits and the pay and all that. I have not a little thumbnail there that's clickable that goes to a video, like a, like a one and a half minute brand video. And it's just me talking and sharing my story of how I started this firm and, and my background. So that job applicant could just see who I am. It's just like a really creative, you know, piece to add to it. Just again, it just, it just looks very, very different than most job applications or description you you would see. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we'll, we'll post to the site for those who want to take a look. This is episode 189. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 189, we'll, uh, we'll have a link up for the, the job description. If you're looking for inspiration on how to hire a little bit differently to get, I guess, to get, to get different talent. Like it's an interesting point that you made Taylor that you, you like, you got a great person who wasn't actually looking 
Because you know, if they're looking, they're on LinkedIn and Indeed and all the rest. If they're not looking, they're not going to be there to see it in the first place. But they might be on their neighborhood app. And you know, once someone says like, hey, this is really cool. You might like it. You should take it, check it out. You can get even someone who wasn't looking to suddenly be looking. And so like, how did you get comfortable with the actual, oh, I've hired an office manager. I guess I actually have to like delegate and let her do things now. <laughs> yeah, it's still one of the hardest things for me is, is to delegate. Even right now, I'm bringing on a virtual assistant, and it's just so painful for me to, to bring that person on and train them and start to hand off these tasks. Like I still have this limiting belief that I'm the only one that can do these things. So it's really challenging. But I, I think for Karen, it was it was much easier because I was so happy to have found such a high quality person with experience, not just experience in our industry, but she also had experience working with Fidelity, who is our custodian. And I just like, I felt like I found this, this, you know, needle in a haystack and I didn't want to lose her. So I had this motivation of making sure that if she had enough work and she was energized and excited to come to work every day. She had stuff to do. I didn't want her sitting around, you know, twiddling her thumbs. And so that was the motivation that I needed. You know, if I'm going to pay this person, I want to keep this person, you know, I better really invest time and, and, and energy and, and even money actually in some situations in order to keep her and, and, and you know, delegate tasks to her. So, yeah. So one of the things that we did in, in the very beginning was, uh, and this came from uh, Matthew Jarvis, I believe, and his team is uh, she went to, we, I sent and, and paid her to go to the Ritz-Carlton customer service training program as a way for her to develop her customer service skills and just, you know, just, yeah, work on herself. And and I didn't, it wasn't something that I forced her to go and do. I just asked her if it'd be something that she was interested in. And, you know, she jumped up and, and went and did it. And just so Ritz really has, has a training program for you know how 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 you do the amazing customer service experience that uh that they're known to do exactly they have a whole playbook that you know they run inside their organization and they share that with other people through this very expensive training program I want to say it's I don't know five or six thousand dollars for a couple of days plus you have to pay for the Ritz Carlton hotel of course but there's well, a way for me at, where else would you host it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But just a way, again, to just invest in her and invest in the, the development of the office manager role. And, you know, it was a big focus of mine the last kind of year or so is to improve our client experience and customer service. And so, yeah, so just, just having her and knowing how high of a quality of a person she was and how lucky we were to have her is just motivation enough to make sure that, that we kept her and that we were, I was delegating things to her. And again, my whole thing every single day, still to this day, it's like, what am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? How can I do more of that every day? So every day I have a little journal on my desk. And if I'm doing something I know I should not be doing, I write it down. And I revisit that on a weekly basis, figure, okay, how can I delegate this to somebody who's good at it, who's actually good at it and actually enjoys doing it? So it's a process that I regularly go through now. And, th and that's how you, like on an ongoing basis, figure out what, what am I delegating and how am I going to get this off my plate? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, just recently I noticed that again, you don't even notice these things, right? You just fly through your day and you're just doing it because you've always done it and you're the owner of the firm and this is just how it all, it's always been. But uh, processing payroll, right? It's so simple. Like we don't have, I only have one W2 employee. It's not a complicated process, but one day I'm like, why am I, we as Gusto payroll, I'm like, why am I in Gusto right now doing this and trying to figure this out? And just one of those things that went on that list worked with Karen to, you know, get her trained and now, you know, handed that task off to her. So now she manages all of our Gusto payroll and paying our independent contractors and paying our bills. And now she's actually, you know, in our, in our QuickBooks and helping with our, our bookkeeper and taxes. So just little things that just, you know, you, you don't think take up a lot of time, but for me, it's, it's almost less than less about the time these days and more about the energy that I gain or lose from doing that task. Like I just want to be doing the things that I'm good at and I really enjoy doing. I want to walk away with, you know, energy, not, not being drained by this stuff. Interesting. Interesting. And so like the, the write down journal just becomes a running list. Anytime you're in the middle of something saying like, I don't know that I'm actually enjoying this. And I could probably train someone else to do it. So this is going to be the last time I do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great exercise. It came from from Stephanie Bogan. She uses this term, you know, above the line or below the line. She's like, you know, every time that you feel like you're below the line, meaning, you know, you know you shouldn't be doing something or it's it's draining your energy, you're walking away with a headache, whatever it is, like write it down. And on the flip side, anything that you enjoy doing, you're having so much fun with, again, energy gaining, like write that down. And it's funny as you start to 
you start to notice a pattern in all these things and just writing it down becomes real life. And again, just gives me the, the motivation I need to, to delegate. And I'm going to imagine it's one of those, like the, the more you do it, the more you do it, because as you got used to letting go of some things, it kind of gets easier for the subsequent ones. Yeah, absolutely. But again, like I'll acknowledge it's still a weak, you know, a, a weakness of mine. I have a hard time letting go of things. I'm kind of a control freak. I am a perfectionist in, in a lot of different ways and just kind of getting over that somebody may not do it the exact way I want them to do it, but just helping us again, reach our goals and stay focused on the things that I'm good at and I enjoy doing. And I think if everybody does that and stays in their lane on our team, like we're going to be much more successful. Our clients are going to benefit. They're going to get much better service. And it's just a better, a better path, you know, going forward. So, so talk to us a little bit more about this process that you said you had early on of like trying to build a good quality website, trying to get some visibility to get marketing going once you had gone out on your own. So I guess just starting even at the website, which I feel like is a, is a pain for a lot of advisors. So did like, did you literally build your own website and, and learn how to do that? Did you, did you hire someone in order to do it? And, and if so, like, who did you hire? How did you find a way to make a website that doesn't look like almost every other website that, as you noted, are usually not very differentiated or 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 just look the same as everybody else? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. And, and that's why I, I started the Experiments in Advisor Marketing podcast. I wanted to share with everybody what's worked, what hasn't worked, what are the mistakes I've made to hopefully you know, so others can learn from these mistakes. And I don't want to call this a mistake, but kind of knowing what I know now, I'm not sure I would do the same thing. But out of the gates in 2014, I hired a local kind of branding website agency, and I wrote them a check for $12,000 to help me bring this website and idea to life to help kind of come up with the firm name and the logo and the color schemes and just everything like this huge, massive branding package. And again, I just didn't really know any better. And, you know, I was committed to spending money to, to grow the firm and, and do things a little bit differently. So yes, yeah, so out of the gates, I spent a lot of money to build the website. Since then, we've gone through a lot of different iterations. I have bounced around through a couple different agencies. But, you know, it still started with pouring, you know, a good amount of money into building the website, building that foundation for the future, which has been really important. We haven't gotten there yet, but I mean, I don't know the exact number. I just say at least 75% of our new clients come directly through our website organically. They find us, they self-schedule appointments with us. And that's how we grow these days. Like our website is literally like our marketing machine. And without it, we just, you know, we wouldn't be growing at the rate we are. All right. I want, I want to come back in a few minutes to 75% of our new clients are, are coming to us organically through the website. But just that this process of like finding someone to like finding a local branding, a website agency, you know, I, I'm sort of drawing from your, your tone of how you're talking about them that you felt like maybe you spent a little bit more than you should have or didn't get the results out of it that you would have liked for the, for the $12,000 that you spent. So I guess help me understand a, like why, why the leap into $12,000 on a branding marketing agency and 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 not some alternative lower cost option for standing up a website and like what led you to or how'd you pick the the folks that you picked yeah i mean i just didn't know any better like i didn't really have anybody guiding me here i was on my own little journey now i had my own firm again i was i was committed to actually spending money on my firm and I, you know and spending money on my firm, I thought that was hiring this you know fancy agency to help me put this together. But I, di I did take it seriously. I interviewed a number of different agencies here in San Diego, kind of narrowed it down to this one group. It was just a, a small team of, of three, you know, really fun, creative people. Yeah, I didn't go through yeah a, a super lengthy process. There were quotes that I was getting for you know twenty five thousand dollars plus, and some quotes I guess were a little bit less. So I just kind of picked one that was in the middle and chose an agency with some people that I felt like you know, I had a good relationship with and could get along with. And it was a lot of fun. We actually had a really lo a lot of fun going through that process. Every week we'd get together and, you know, go to the local pizza shop, have some craft beers and just get really creative and come up with different ideas, you know, for the firm and for the website. One of the things that they helped come up with that still lives on my website today, although it's gone through a few different kind of graphic design iterations, but 
on our homepage, about two thirds of the way down underneath my bio, there's these clever little icons with a little description about the name of my dog and my favorite golf course and my favorite restaurant. And then there's little blurbs that we tie back to finance uh, and, and financial terms. And so that's something that's been on my website since day one that they kind of helped come up with. And it's still to this day is one of those things that most people comment on when they reference my website. So we just had a lot of fun going through that creative process. But in hindsight, I just don't think I was ready to go through that process. Like I just didn't know what I wanted my firm to look like, who our ideal client was, what our process was going to be, what happened if somebody lands on our website and they want to work with you, what are they going to do? Like, I just didn't have any of that nailed down. I talk a lot about on the podcast about how I think us advisors, we tend to get ahead of ourselves. We think like we have to go and, and, you know, I want to start a podcast. So I'm going to go spend $5,000 on a podcast launch package. That's another mistake that I made. I probably shouldn't have done that without, you know, first recording a few episodes into a microphone, which costs, you know, close to nothing when all of us have an iPhone in our pocket. And so that was just a mistake I made. I think I was just jumping ahead a little bit, thinking that money would maybe solve my problem or help me get to where I want to get. And in hindsight, just it wasn't necessary. Now today, I have no problem spending $12,000 on my website, knowing exactly what we needed to do, what our processes are, what exactly we want somebody to do when they land on our website. Like I'm so clear on all of that. I don't mind spending money, but I think I was just getting ahead of myself back then. It's an an interesting distinction that, you know, sometimes we were not happy with the results. So there's kind of this almost literally like I'm I'm going to throw some money at this to try to solve it at the end of the day the real problem is we're not actually clear on where we're trying to get in the first place and if we're not really clear on where we're trying to get then the reality is throwing dollars at it usually doesn't really actually help solve the problem because you'll you'll hire an expert to come in and help you achieve whatever it is you're visioning and the truth is you don't actually have clarity on what you're visioning so they may not really know what what it takes to get you there But when you have the clarity, then going back and saying, hey, I want to spend on this or that suddenly makes it so much easier and more straightforward because now I actually know what I'm shooting for. Yeah, exactly. I just, yeah, it becomes so much easier. You'll have so much more success. Again, I think it's just really easy for all of us to get ahead of ourselves. I always say like start. You know, you have to do the hard work first. If if starting a firm and building a website just seems really fun and easy and there's no friction at all and you're just having a good time, you're, you're probably doing it all wrong. Like when you go and start your firm is, you know, build your website and, and build your initial marketing funnels and strategies, like it should be a lot of work. It should be really, really, really challenging. You should be working on those workflows and those processes and doing all the hard work behind the scenes first. And then once that's nailed down, then you get to do all the fun stuff and kind of bring it to life and build the landing pages and the logos and choose the colors. And, you know, but just a lot of times we do things backwards. Again, I think the podcast is a good example. Like, I want to start a podcast. I'm going to go spend $5,000 on a launch package. Like, why don't you just record a few episodes into your phone? See if you even like podcasting to begin with. See if you're even, you know, good at it and get some traction. And then you can go and spend some money and, you know, throw some gasoline on the fire. I feel like the the fear for so many of us is why... I don't want to do it and put it out there and have it be crappy, have it be unprofessional. To me, part of the pressure, it's not just like, oh, I have an idea for a thing, so let's throw a bunch of money at it and do it. But well, I don't, I don't want to just do it and have it be not good and then have it not reflect well on me. I, I, I got to spend some money to make sure it's polished out of the gate. Is, is it just not a good way of thinking about it? I think that's fair. And I think that's fair for certain things. You know, you don't have to go spend $12,000 to have a good looking website. My personal website, taylorschulte.com, I built for $200. I don't think you'd go there and say it looks unprofessional. It cost me $200 though. So you can, you know, you you can build something that looks nice, you know, especially a website that that's your storefront. I'm not saying to go spend two hundred dollars, but you could probably spend a couple thousand dollars and have something that looks really nice. But again, I just think you need to do the hard work first before you know really bringing some of this stuff to life and really spending a lot of money on it. Money is not going to solve the problem for sure. And the hard work meaning find a way to try it and do it for a bit and make sure see if it works, if you get any traction, if you like it, like whatever the marketing strategy is and. If it works and you like it and it's going well, by all means, like roll, roll out the money and start, and start spending and, and uh, amplifying and scaling it up. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot of great content creators go the same path when they're exploring a new medium or whatnot. Like 
in the beginning, you know, they're using their iPhone or using a cheap microphone or whatever it might be. Like, it just doesn't look that great, but the content, as you know, matters more than anything. And so once they get rolling and they're like, all right, this is a channel I really want to pour some money into, take the next level, then, then they can do that. But I think a lot of us, again, I mean, going back to the podcast world, the, the first question I get from people is like, what equipment should I buy? And I'm like, do you have an iPhone in your pocket? Why don't we just start there? So yeah, I, I just think we have to be careful about some of the shiny objects out of the gate, really prove to ourselves that it's something we enjoy, something that we're good at, something that we can stay committed to before we go spend thousands of dollars on it. So for advisors who maybe still struggle with this, like just, okay, but how do I actually get a good, decent looking website and pick a provider who will do a decent job? Like, is there a go-to person or provider at this point for you? Or like, it seems like you've gone this spectrum from you stood up your personal brand website for 200 bucks, you stood up your firm's website for $12,000. Like, what should we be spending? And where should we be going to try to find someone that does this appropriately? Sure. Yeah. So I work with a company out here in San Diego called Tiny Frog. So they took over from the last agency about three years ago. Candidly, if I add everything up that I've spent with Tiny Frog in the previous agency, I mean, I've spent over $50,000 on my website easily. I'm regularly spending a couple thousand dollars here and there on little projects to improve you know, certain aspects of the website. Again, I have no problem investing in our website today with, with the clarity that we have. Tiny Frog is a great agency. I've looped them in with a ton of advisors around the country. They do a really good job. You know, I don't want to quote them, but I, I feel like for five to seven thousand dollars you can get a pretty good looking website up and running you know get that really good foundation going and then you can build from there on the flip side like i said my personal website i use a company called studio press uh it's kind of a diy service to to build your own website it's built on the genesis framework which you might know is just a really good framework and foundation for building a website really fast really easy to use really user friendly so you basically in install the genesis framework on wordpress pick a theme, pick a template, get that installed, and then you're kind of on your way. So you are kind of restricted to a certain theme, but for, again, a couple hundred bucks, like it looks pretty darn good and you save a lot of money. And so for a lot of us, like, you know, we can just start there, build a good foundation, get clear on really what we're trying to do, and then, you know, hire you know, additional experts from there. And I am struck just as you're talking through this, that at no point are you mentioning like, I guess just call them like industry advice or website providers. This is all like local agencies, local designers, local providers. Like, is that just a, you, you like to buy local and work with local or is there something else to the dynamic of you prefer website designers, not in, not in our industry to providers and folks that are in our industry? That's a really good question. So yeah, so out of the gates in 2014, when I was looking for you know expert help in the marketing and branding arena, I was specifically looking for somebody who had never worked with a financial advisor before. I wanted them to look at this from a whole different angle, through a whole different lens. I wanted it to look and feel different. So that that's what I did. Now, today, that's not really the case. Again, Tiny Frog works with advisors all over the country now. But yeah, I've always tried to do that. And still today in how I learn and, and grow from a marketing perspective, at least once a year, at least pre-COVID, at least once a year, I would commit to going to a conference where no other financial advisor was there. I wanted to go somewhere like and just learn from a totally different perspective. And so I'm always trying to read things that advisors might not be reading and just really think outside the box. And I've done that in hiring, you know, contractors and, and web agencies and, and all that stuff. You know, not a knock on any of those companies that do focus on advisors. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But again, I just wanted to take a totally different creative approach and have somebody look at it through a different lens. Now, that's worked for me and it's also worked against me because there are certain instances where I hired a, a Facebook ad expert who had not really had any experience in working with a financial advisory firm, didn't really understand the sales cycle of a high net worth retiree, and we wasted a lot of money there. So I think there are certain circumstances where hiring somebody who has experience in working with financial advisors can really benefit you. You're talking about the Facebook advertiser from outside of the industry in my head, I'm, I'm just thinking like, please don't say they did a testimonials campaign. Please don't say they did a testimonials campaign. No, 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 no. 
No, it's just, you know, the, again, like this, the sales cycle of a fee only financial planning firm looks much different than, you know, somebody selling a book or a course or, you know, even an insurance agent that's selling transactional insurance. It's just a totally different sales cycle. And the lack of understanding there really worked against us and caused us to, to waste a lot of money. And so out of curiosity, like what, what drove you in the direction of, well, I guess I should say this way, I, what do you view that makes oh, an advisor website good and unique that's distinct from the traditional advisor website that you're, you're not such a fan of? Yeah, I mean, I think most advisors these days have have great looking websites, right? From a design perspective, everybody has hired somebody, they've spent some money. Most advisors have great looking websites these days. My critique these days is I think most advisors have too many things going on on their website. They have call to action buttons everywhere. They have sign up here. They have learn more. They have click here and about us and contact us. Like there's just way too much going on. So nowadays, I think getting again, really clear. I think one of the most wasted spaces on a website is the hero image area, which is that, you know, when you go to a website, that very first, you know, image that you see at the top um, and the content over the hero image, the hero text, like you know, that's the first thing that somebody is going to see. And it should be crystal clear. Uh, you've probably heard the statistic before, but a consumer might spend, you know, five to seven seconds on your website before they hit the back button. And so just getting really clear on exactly what you do and who you do it for. And then the rest of the, the homepage and the rest of the website, you know, really cleaned up and really reducing the number of things that you want the, the consumer to do. And I, I talk a lot about how you could have, the best marketing strategies in the world. You could have the like the the most SEO optimized website in the world. You could have tens of thousands of, of people landing on your website. But if you don't have a clear path for them to take, if they don't know exactly what to do when they get to your website, you could have just like tons of wasted opportunities. So, you know, we really have to think about the the journey of the consumer. And when they land on your website, what do you want them to do? And if they do that thing, what does that process look like? What's the first step? What's the second step? What's the third step? And that's the hard part, right? Most advisors don't have that process nailed down. They don't really know what they want the person to do, or they work with multiple demographics and every process looks a little bit differently. So that's where it gets challenging. But I think, yeah, these days, most advisors just have too many things going on on their website and can really benefit from cleaning things up and getting really narrow. So now talk to us as well. You said early on, you kind of had this sort of two-step process of like, I got to build a good website so that if I can get people to show up, like they will see it, they will be interested, they will feel compelled to, to contact us, we'll have an opportunity for new business with them. So you, you you put a big spend towards the design of the site and the brand. And then you'd said the second part was, then you put a big focus on getting visibility so you could get found or the website can get found. So so talk to us more about the, the visibility stage. So as I think you noted earlier, even, even for some of us that put some time into our website or some kind of content we're marketing, whether a blog, podcast, the ebook, whatever it is, we're not always great at, at actually getting the visibility and the distribution part to get it out there once we made the thing. So what, what was the visibility approach for you? How did you tackle this? Yeah. So again, going back to my example with the personal injury, injury attorney who has to spend $30,000 a month just to stand out from their competitors, the, the good news for every advisor listening to this is you don't really have to do a whole lot to stand out online. Not yet. Like it's, it's getting, you know, maybe harder and harder by the day, but it's still not that challenging. And so one of the things that I spent a lot of time on was improving our local SEO. So when a consumer here in San Diego went to Google and, and typed in or types in financial planner San Diego or financial advisor San Diego, you know, we show up in the search rankings on page one of Google. So we have that visibility. And the good thing again is it's really not that challenging. There's there's no real magic to SEO or local SEO. Like Google just wants to know who you are and what you do and, and, you know, maybe who you do it for. And Google gives us that playbook and they tell us what they want from us and how to help them connect the dots. It's just most of us, most advisors just fail to do that. So there's just some really, really basic things that you can do from an SEO level to tell Google what you're all about. So that when a consumer goes to Google and says, I'm looking for a financial advisor in San Diego, your firm shows up. And again, I told you, I'm, I'm surrounded by very successful multi-billion dollar firms. 
that don't show up anywhere on the page one or on page one or page two of Google. So it just didn't take long in order to gain that visibility. I guess I should also say, you know, I, I made a b- big push in kind of the PR and the media space, responding to a lot of media quotes, just trying to kind of quickly build some visibility, not just locally, but nationally as well. Just again, when we were a no-name brand and company that just showed up and so trying to get some credibility that way uh, was certainly helpful. But yeah, there's just some like really basic, basic local SEO or just SEO stuff that you can do to your website to just tell Google who you are and what you do. And and most people just fail to do that simple step. So, so can you talk a little about just what what some of those things were like, what, what did you do that turned on the magic juice? Yeah. So there's a great free tool out there that I think most people know about, at least I hope they do at this point called Yoast SEO. And it's just a plugin that you can install on your website and it'll, it'll guide you through some of these, these basics. And again, one of the basics, 99% of advisor websites I go look up, don't have this basic thing nailed down, which is adding a correct uh, meta title and meta description to your website. So when you Google Define Financial, the name of my firm, for instance, you'll see the title of my site isn't just Define Financial, but it's Define Financial dash Certified Financial Planner San Diego. So I've included my target keyword, Financial Planner San Diego, in that site title. So I'm telling Google, here's the name of our firm, but we're also, just to clarify, we're financial planners in San Diego. So that site title is so, so, so important. And most advisor websites I see and I go look up, it'll just say the firm name and it won't say anything else. Or in some cases, it'll just say something like homepage, right? It won't even have the firm name. And it's just this really simple thing that you can go and do on the back end of your WordPress to, again, just help Google connect the dots. And, and you can take it one there. Not even just sort of what you are, but you kind of worked in like, we're a fee only financial planning firm in San Diego because there are people who may literally type fee only financial planner San Diego if that's what they're looking for. So, you know, you want to own that for however many people type that in. It's a big, it's a big city. You only need a few people to type it in and come to your website to actually get some good flow of clients. Yep. Yep. That's correct. Yeah. So you have that site title that you can manipulate and then you have the, the description, the website description, they call it the the meta description. And again, it's just a couple of sentences further explaining what you do and who you do it for and trying to capture some of those keywords. And again, there's no like magic formula here. It's just, you know, Google wants to know who, who we are so that when a consumer is searching, they can, they can put us there. Now in a more competitive industry, there are some more challenges to work through and some more advanced, you know, techniques you can take advantage of. But for us, like it was just the really simple, basic SEO stuff that really worked well out of the gates. And like the beauty of this is that when a consumer goes to Google and types in financial advisor, San Diego, that means like they're actively looking for an advisor. They're going to Google on their own saying, I'm looking for a financial advisor in, in San Diego. And they see our website and they click on it. And then our website has a really clear journey for them to take. It just like, it makes it so much easier than me, you know, spending money on Facebook ads, putting it in front of people that may or may not be looking for an advisor. And so I know through some, some research that about 200 people per month are going to Google here in San Diego, typing in financial advisor, San Diego, or financial planner, San Diego, or some iteration of that. So I have 200 people per month, which maybe doesn't sound like a big number, but to me, that's, that's plenty. And in turn, it, it leads to these days you know, because we have a higher minimum these days and we've gotten really narrow with our demographic, we get about one person per week that self-schedules an introductory phone call, you know, through our website. And they may not come just from organic Google search. There are some other marketing channels that, you know, we take part in, but that's certainly a big one. And again, it's just low hanging fruit that most people, you know, fail to take advantage of. Get Yoast SEO installed because it prompts you around things like, do you have a meta title and a meta description for your, for your website and your homepage? Are there sort of other low-hanging fruit areas in the world of local SEO that that you focused on or that you'd encourage other other advisors to be paying some attention to? Yeah, I think I think another easy one or a couple other easy ones are are one, you know, most people have claimed their their Google My Business page. I, they keep changing the name of it, but I think it's Google My Business is what they call it now, claiming that page for your business and then optimizing that as well. So there's some different categories that you can choose um, for your business and you can choose multiple categories, which most people don't know about. So you, you know, you can put financial planner, you could also add financial advisor, you can also add investment consultant and a few other ones. So complete that Google My Business profile, add those keywords into there, 
Also, you can add images to your Google My Business profile. So take some nice pictures of your office, inside your office, outside your office, your team. You can title those images to include some of those keywords like Financial Planner San Diego. So if I upload a photo of our office building to Google My Business, I'll name that file Financial Advisor San Diego Office, right? So I'll kind of slip that keyword into the image title. I don't know if there's any like real data that says it's going to magically, you know, help us in terms of SEO, but I think just as much as you can do to again help Google connect the dots and nothing stopping you from doing it seems seems like a no-brainer. So claim that profile, get that thing optimized, get it updated, make sure all the information's relevant. I'm happy to dig into it if you want, but you can start to work on um, getting clients to leave reviews for you, which I know is a kind of, you're walking a fine line there from a compliance perspective, but I can talk about how we approach it or it's something that we're currently approaching right now. Yeah. How, how do you approach these? I, you know, I, I know for a lot of advisors, a lot of appeal to having clients leave favorable reviews, whether it's a Google My Business page, Yelp reviews as well. We still have this fine line of not soliciting referrals. The SEC has been clear, like, look, if a client of their own volition leaves a review on a third-party website that you didn't create and is not under your control, like, you know, pe- people are going to talk. You can't, you can't stop them from that, nor are you in trouble for that. But that's still a fine line about like, well, how do I get them there? Can I get them to the site? And then they and then they just kind of figure out to leave their own review there. How do you actually handle that in practice? Yeah. So obviously big disclaimer here, right? Like go talk to your attorney and your compliance department. Uh, but this is what we've been advised, which is as long as you ask everyone and you're not cherry picking your favorite client, asking them to leave a review, as long as you ask everybody to leave an honest review online, you're you're covering your bases there. You know, we can't manipulate what they say or what they do. We can't, you know, delete and control any of those reviews. So um, every single quarter, when our quarterly reports go out to our clients, they get an email from us. It says, hey, client, your quarterly report is in your client vault. We use eMoney. Our entire life lives in eMoney. So it just goes straight to their client vault and eMoney. So, hey, your quarterly report's in your client vault. You know, go check it out. Let us know if you have any questions. And then what we've done in the most recent quarter is I added a couple paragraphs saying, you know, we really appreciate your, your trust and support. Something about like we lead with transparency and, and on that, you know, we'd love you know, you to share your experience with other people online, you know, click here to leave a, an honest review of, of your experience in working with our firm. And so that goes out to all of our clients, right? We're not cherry picking any of them and they can decide whether they want to leave a review or not and, and what they say. So it's kind of a new venture for us. As you'll see on Google, we don't really have a lot of reviews, but it does help from an SEO perspective. So something that we certainly want to work on. So are there any other major areas to be cognizant of in the in this world of of local SEO, you know, Yoast SEO for meta title, meta description, claiming your Google My Business page, nudging clients to leave reviews as long as you do it broadly for all of them in a consistent manner. Yeah. So I look at this, I look at our marketing activities like this marketing wheel. Like we want to do six or seven things really well, really consistently. And they all kind of work together to, you know, help us re- reach our growth goals. And so there's a lot of them that, you know, people have heard of like you know, creating high quality content, right? And so we have a blog on the firm website and at least every month we're writing a high quality blog post that's also optimized for SEO. And so we're keeping that up to date and and that certainly helps. We have a few blog posts that rank very, very high for some very big keywords. And so that helps with traffic to the website. And again, like going back to our other conversation about having a process, we don't just write these blog posts and just throw them up there. We actually have a workflow, a process for how these blog posts get created. And it goes from one person to another person to another person, you know, to make sure that things are correctly optimized, that it's a high quality piece of content, that it matches up with, you know, our firm and our philosophy and and everything. Like um, it is a buttoned up process that every piece of content goes through. And I think, you know, you're a good testament of that as well. I know you guys have a process behind the scenes. So we take that really seriously and we've worked really hard to to build up the blog and build up credibility that way. I'll say one thing on the blog, the world of, of SEO has changed quite a bit. It used to be frequency and quantity mattered most, right? If you just blogged every single day, just wrote something every single day, Google would would reward you for that. These days, it's more about quality than quantity. So you could literally have just 10 or five of the very best pieces on 
you know, retirement planning or Roth conversions or whatever it is, just like five of the very best pieces of content on that specific topic. And Google will heavily reward you for that. And so what we've done recently is we've gone through a lot of our blog posts and we've consolidated them. For instance, we had a few blog posts on cybersecurity, credit freezes, credit scores. And so we consolidated those into one giant piece on how to stay safe online, how to freeze your credit, you know, what your credit score is, how to check it. And now it's just like one giant awesome piece on all those things. So that's one thing you can do too, is if you have been blogging for a while and you haven't had a lot of success, as you can go through kind of a blog cleanup process. And that's something that we delegated to a professional writer to help us do that and consolidate that content. And that's really helped a lot. And and then you said you spent you you made a big push into the in the PR space as well. So, like, what was the strategy there? How did you get PR opportunities? What was the what was the path for you? Yeah. So initially, again, uh, I wouldn't call it a mistake because it actually worked pretty well for me. I did hire a PR consultant. I found a woman that was leaving a large firm and, and starting her own firm. So I got a pretty good deal on her services. But again, I just felt like here I am, this no-name firm in a big city, like I wanted to get some visibility and get some credibility. And so she really helped do that for me out of the gates, lined up some really good interviews, you know, some guest contributions to some local newspapers. I got a writing gig with a local newspaper out of that and, you know, was able to build some relationships with journalists through that, that I, I still work with today. So again, I don't know that it was really necessary, but it definitely helped give me a head start out of the gates. I only used her for about 12 months. And then again, I kind of realized I can just do this on my own. I can reach out to reporters and, you know, I can kind of pitch myself on to, to different, you know, radio shows or podcasts or, or whatever else. But I did work with her for about 12 months. And then nowadays, yeah, I just, I've got, you know, a handful of journalists that I work with that will reach out. And so we're regularly trying to stay, you know, up, up, up to date. One of the things that we have on our website is a press page. We try to keep that up to date. I think one of the worst things you could do is have a press page that hasn't been updated since 2017 or something. And so if you are going to have a press page, you know, make sure it's something you keep updated. And so nowadays we just respond to media queries, you know, from FPA, from NAPFA, from XYPN, and just try to kind of, you know, stay online and get some visibility. So yeah, so that certainly ha- has been helpful. Interesting. And, and so curious, like what, what did you spend and invest into a PR consultant as you were getting going? Yeah, I paid $2,000 per month for, for 12 months. And that's probably you know a fraction of what you'd pay if you went to a professional PR firm. But again, I was lucky, found someone who was leaving a large firm, was willing to do it at, let's call it, discounted rate. And I, yeah, I learned a lot about you know a PR in the world of media and how it works and, and media training and how to prepare and you know how to talk to reporters. And so it, it was certainly really helpful. Did I need to go and spend $24,000 to do it? Probably not. But again, just one of the mistakes I made of thinking I can just go spend money on something to, to solve my problem. And so like in, in retrospect, would you have done it differently or just glad I spent $24,000 for the learning process? I just didn't need to re-up it because at that point, I, I felt I had traction. I think I got lucky. I think I was able to find a very high quality, experienced PR expert to help me at what I think is a fair price. But you know that that's not easy to find. I think most most people can benefit from doing this on their own. And again, it gets much easier if you have a niche or a target demographic that you work with. You know, we only work with retirees these days, so I know where retirees live, what what they read, what publications they they read, and so now I can kind of zone in on those publications, and it doesn't really. You know, I don't need to. I don't need to be featured everywhere, right? Like I can write for Kiplinger. I can. I've got a a journalist that works with AARP, and so it just becomes much easier when you have a really a really narrow niche. But yeah, I, th- I think with all the opportunities out there, again through what you guys have done with XYPN, the FPA has a media query service that a lot of people don't know about. You have to go through a little media training thing. I'm drawing a blank on his name over there, but you have to do a media training thing with him. And Lewis. But, yeah. And Lewis. Yep. Yep. And they send, you know, a bunch of things every single day. So I think for the most part, uh, I don't think hiring a a PR agency is necessary, but yeah, after 12 months, I just, I recognized we could just be managing this on our own and and save some money and redirect that somewhere else. So, so you mentioned there are even other marketing channels floating out there as well. So what are, what else are you into from the marketing perspective at this point? you've talked about good anchor website, 
lots of local SEO that builds, you know, building some of the PR visibility and credibility. So what else is in the, the marketing quiver for you? Yeah. So three years ago, I launched a podcast. It was initially called Stay Wealthy San Diego, kind of a spin on the, the Ron Burgundy, Stay Classy San Diego. So again, I was going after this kind of hyper local marketing strategy. I was interviewing. It was almost like, like a how I built this, but for local business owners and entrepreneurs. And again, this kind of falls back on, I just didn't really have a clear strategy. I just saw everyone else starting podcasts. So I thought I'd start a podcast and I had a clever name that I dreamt of and, and just kind of went for it. I learned a lot by going through that process you know, in, in the world of podcasting, but I learned pretty quickly that it really wasn't serving me in any way other than my intellectual curiosity. You know, I was able to you know, interview some really cool people, but it, it wasn't really supporting any, any of my goals. And so I'd say after about 12 months, I decided to get more clear and build a strategy around that podcast and reach a broader audience. So I chopped off San Diego. I rebranded the podcast as Stay Wealthy. And as we got more clear with our niche and exactly who we work with at my firm, I've started to cater the content directly to that person. So coming up with an actual avatar that we're, we're speaking to and the content's created for just, I mean, just really fueled growth. So as soon as I got really crystal clear on who that avatar was and created content for that person and marketed the podcast, you know, around those people, it just really started to blow up. I shared with you before we started the show, the Stay Wealthy podcast has now crept into the, the top 200 on iTunes for investing podcasts. We've built up just a really, really fun, engaged audience. Um, it's been a lot of fun building that. It's interesting because a couple of months ago, I was interviewed on another uh, industry podcast and I was sharing with them how my Stay Wealthy podcast doesn't really generate any prospects for our firm and that I'm just kind of giving away free information. And yes, it's growing and yes, it's a top 200 podcast and it's a lot of fun, but we weren't really getting prospects from it. And so I changed a few things in the last couple months. I think just in the last month, we've had eight potential clients come directly from the podcast. So I've learned some things there you know, in the marketing space I'm happy to share, but that podcast is certainly one of our, our marketing spokes in our wheel along with a few other things that we can dig into. So, yeah, so I'm very curious like what did you what did you do to turn just your know, podcast listener into someone that's actually reaching out to do business? Yeah, so so here's the thing, you know, we we think that everybody knows what we do, that we're a financial advisor, that we're taking on new clients. Like we just think that people would assume that, but but they don't. And so you have to draw the stuff in crayon for people and say, I am a financial advisor. I am taking on new clients or I'm taking on 10 more clients this year, whatever it is. We work with people over the age of 50, focus on planning for retirement that have a million dollars or more in investable assets. Like you have to draw the stuff in crayon for people and then tell them exactly what you want them to do. You know, we've designed a free retirement checkup. You can go to definefinancial.com, click on the purple button and learn more. And so just getting really clear, drawing that in crayon for them, telling them exactly what I do and, and who we do it for and giving them, you know, an action plan just really, you know, got people out of their seats to actually take action. They heard things like, oh, I didn't know you were taking on new clients or yeah, I didn't know you were a financial advisor. I know you used to be a financial advisor. And so sometimes we just make these assumptions. And so we just have to be really clear at that and and do it in a in an authentic, non-salesy way either, right? Like I don't want to turn people away by doing that. Roger Whitney does a fantastic job at this. He kind of works it into his disclaimer, which I love. You know, it's like, hey, you know, talk to your trusted advisors before you take action. If you don't have one, I'm a financial advisor. And he kind of works it in really, really cleverly there. But, you know, we have to, again, kind of draw and crayon for people and make sure that they know what we do and, and who we do it for. So that's that's really helped a lot. And I am just wondering, like, how, how are you getting them to the the action point or where are you telling them to go? Because I know the challenge for a lot of advisors that that are doing podcasting is just the cool thing about it is that it's this audio medium that people can listen to wherever they are. You know, I, uh, I, I know for our podcast, at least the the primary channels are, are uh, commuting to work, exercising, walking the dog, mowing the lawn and cooking dinner. Like those are the five primary places that people tend to listen to us. You're not all of which are necessarily points at which someone can easily like type something into their phone or go to a website to do a thing. And then by the time they're supposed to do it, they've forgotten the podcast or what the link was like, how are you actually 
getting them to do something? What are you trying to get them to do when it's not exactly a seminar where you can tell them in captive attention, like, okay, now pull out your phone and do this. You're trying to capture them in a podcast world. It is really challenging. It's really challenging to get people to take action from a podcast because you're right. Somebody's driving or they're at the gym. And you know, if you have a free guide for them to download, they're just not really in a position to go to that landing page and download that guide right then and there and, and join your email list. So it is really challenging. I think it's important to highlight here how long I've had the podcast before things really started to work, right? It didn't happen on day one or year one or year two. So it's something that I've stayed committed to for three years now. And I've just gotten better and better at it. I've gotten clearer and clearer. I've made changes. I've made improvements. I've invested in it. I've hired people to help me with it, you know, consultants and, and, and all that. So I think it's important just to note that these things take a long time. Again, people like our, our good friend, Roger Whitney, like, I mean, I don't know how long he's been doing it, what, six, seven, eight years. So it does, it does take time to build that trust with somebody. And, and then when, you know, again, you're regularly being clear about you know, you taking on clients and, and what that looks like and who you do your best work with and giving them that action. You kind of just say that over and over again, when somebody is ready for something and they're ready to make a move, like hopefully you're just the first person that they think of. But yeah, it, it, it is, it is a challenge for sure, which again is like, it's just one of our marketing spokes. I don't rely on the podcast to, to feed prospective clients to our firm. It's going to go through waves. And right now we've had a big wave of, of people coming in, but it's going to quiet down and our other marketing channels will, will help supplement that and, and keep us afloat. But that's why I encourage people to kind of look at their whole marketing plan, right? It's like, you know, the a good analogy would be a financial plan. You know, you could, you could go buy an awesome insurance policy, right? But it doesn't mean the rest of your financial life is buttoned up. So we might have a great podcast that works, you know, from time to time, it's not everything. And so we need to have, you know, a diversified marketing approach and kind of look at everything all together. And, and so then what are the other marketing channels? You've said like, you know, at some point the podcast won't be firing, but we've got other things that we're running as well. So what, what are the other areas that support? Yeah. So let's see. So, so local SEO blog, the content there, the podcast, email marketing has always been a big one for us. Candidly, it's been something that I've, I've not spent a lot of time on or been very good at, but we have slowly built an email list over the years since I started the firm. So having a lead magnet or two on the website to you know get people to join that email list and then having... Again, haven't done a good job of creating any sort of like nurturing funnel. We do have a, a little bit of a, a sequence that they'll go through when they download that guide, uh, but nothing that we've had much success with. So as you might know, we're recently now exper experimenting with Snappy Kraken to help take some of that weight off our shoulders and, and improve our, our email marketing efforts. And so that's been a really good experience so far. I think we've been up and running with them for two or three months now. And I think I shared with you personally we had a woman that was on my email list since 2014 when I started the firm. She has read every single blog post. She's read every single email, but she's never taken action. We brought Snappy Kraken on board and got, let's call it just a little bit more aggressive with our email marketing, which I was really uncomfortable with at first. It just felt a little too salesy for me. But again, I think sometimes you just need to draw the stuff in crayon for people and really put yourself out there. And so now six years later, she has taken action and she we just had our second meeting with her a couple of weeks ago. So a nice little success story that's come out of that. So uh, email marketing is something that we're really focused on right now in addition to everything else. On that, we've also taken the next step with Snappy Kraken and we've engaged them for social media advertising. So we're pouring $500 a month starting to start to put some Facebook ads out there to try to get people into these to these email funnels. For those who aren't familiar, just can you describe Snappy, Snappy Crack and what they what they do, what they what they do for you? Yeah, so they're what we'd call an email marketing automation service. I like to just highlight that I don't expect Snappy or a service like Snappy to generate leads for our firm. That's not their job. Their job is to create this, this automated email marketing platform delivering high quality content you know, to prospective clients, getting them engaged and you know, ultimately trying to get them to take action. But as we know, Michael, like it can it can take, well, in some cases, it could take six years for somebody to take action. And so Snappy will uh, handle all of that for you. They'll write all of the content, all the emails. 
They'll create the nice PDF guides that you see other firms have, you know, you know, top 10 tax planning things for you to take advantage of in 2020. Like they'll, they'll write all of that for you, brand it for your firm, and then create those email funnels so that when somebody downloads your free guide and gives you their email address, they're going to get a series of emails that are again, crafted by Snappy and their team, kind of guiding them through a little bit of a journey and then ultimately asking them to take some sort of an action. And again, it can seem a little abrasive or a little salesy at times, but I think if you do enough of that and you're consistent with it, again, I think it can create some some new opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise had. And it's just something that we, again, we are just too kind of soft with our email marketing thinking, oh, we'll just put really good information in front of people on a consistent basis. And if they want to work with us, they know where to find us. And it just didn't really work until we started getting a little bit more serious. And and when you say like you you don't expect them to to create leads, like it's not that you're not expecting to get new client business from this. It sounds like the point is just you still take on yourself to have a good website and podcast and other things that like make people show up on your site the first time so that they can hit a button and get onto the email list that Snappy Kraken administers. Snappy Kraken's job is then to take and manage this email list and what's being sent to them so that eventually this lead that you initially put into this funnel moves through a funnel and becomes a a prospect meeting at some point in a few months or six years, as the case may be. Yeah. I mean, it it all hinges on us, right? I mean, we we know that a potential client isn't just going to read an email and schedule a phone call and become a client, right? They're going to do additional research and due diligence. They're going to come to our website. They're going to look at what our process is. They're going to look at who we work with. They're going to get a feel for who they who we are. They might read some blog posts. They might listen to the podcast. Like there's going to be a lot of different touches before they actually reach out to our firm in, in most cases. And so, yeah, Snappy's you know, job is to just create really high quality, informative content, you know, try to get people to take some action, but, but ultimately it does hinge on us to create a good experience for somebody. And so it just goes back to, again, like having that process nailed down so that when we have somebody that gets into our email marketing automation service through Snappy, everything else is buttoned up. Like if somebody wants to take action, it's a really clear path for them. At the end of every single email from Snappy, it's customized to say, click here to get a free retirement checkup. And they click there and it goes to a landing page that we built. Snappy didn't build it. We built it that takes them through the exact step-by-step process for how they can evaluate our firm and potentially become a client. If we didn't have that, I don't know how much success we'd have and it wouldn't be Snappy's fault. That's for sure. You said as well that you've kind of shifted some of your dollars and resources over the years to like, not just spending on providers to help with this, but also that you like learning it yourself, like doing it and going to conferences and reading books around around marketing. And granted, not all advisors are necessarily inclined that way. Some would like to hire external service providers to do that for them because they're they're focused in other areas. But for the ones that do actually want to go deeper in their own marketing knowledge and, and learning journey, are there particular like books or programs or uh, like I was going to say events and conferences, maybe events and conferences that might be back in 2021. Like, where should advisors go if they want to to get deeper on this and think about it and look further? Yeah. So one of the first things that that I always start with, and I think I just kind of have a natural eye for this, but whenever I respond well to a YouTube video that I watched or a blog post that I read or a billboard that I saw or a magazine ad, whatever, whenever I'm like, Ooh, that's kind of cool. Like that really stood out to me. Like I opened that, I read that, or I watched that whole thing. Like I'll ask myself why, right? Like, like, what are they doing differently? What, what really stood out? Why did I click that link? And I just like really pay attention to other people and how they do things and just kind of take what seems to work well or what I respond well to and try to apply that to what we do. So, you know, some of these names are going to be familiar to some of your listeners. One of my favorites who's become a friend is, is Noah Kagan. Noah Kagan is a brilliant marketer that has, you know, no business in the financial advisory space. But you can learn a lot from what he's done building his platform and his brand and taking what works and kind of applying it to our space. So he's someone that I've, I've followed you know, very closely for a long time. Pat Flynn is, is here in San Diego. I know a lot of advisors are, are familiar with Pat Flynn these days. But again, he's not in our space at all. He has little mastermind groups that he hosts and conferences that you won't see a financial advisor at. 
that you can learn a lot from. I've gone as far as attending a conference that I don't really recommend anybody go to, but it's called Traffic and Conversion. There's like 7,000 people there selling trinkets and t-shirts and books and courses and, and all that stuff. And while there's a lot of kind of like slimy sales tactics and marketing taxes, tactics that go on there, I can still go to something like that and pick out the things that I think are high quality and that could work really well. And again, try to apply it to our space. So I'm just kind of this, this constant like lifelong learner, just trying to pay attention to people around me. I don't really read many books. Books. I don't really have any like books to recommend. It's more of just kind of people and paying attention to what other people are doing online. And I think, I mean, even you, Michael, I mean, you know, uh, you know, taking a look at, at how you operate and how you create content and what that looks like and what it feels like. I mean, just really pay attention to that stuff and try to think, how can I apply that to what I do? Like what feels good and, and natural to me? Well, I appreciate that. Again, for folks who are listening, this is episode 189. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 189, We'll have links out for Noah Kagan and Pat, Pat Flynn and, and Traffic Conversion Summit if you want to go and, and explore some of these and dig further. So, Taylor, you said like marketing at this point, 75% of your clients are coming through the website. So, it just help get us up to speed of what, I guess, like what marketing looks like or how you think about marketing at this point in terms of like what you're doing, what's, what's generating business, what's working, how do you think, how do you describe your marketing strategy at this point? Yeah. So I I think it's, you know, a lot of the stuff that we just talked about, let's call it five or six things that I think we do really well and really consistently. And these things aren't static, right? Like every single day I'm looking at this stuff, like how can we make this better? I've spent countless hours with snappy crack and getting, you know, onboarded and get everything worked out. But that doesn't mean we're done. Like every day I'm thinking, okay, how can we improve this process? So, you know, those five or six things that we're doing really well, really consistently trying to get better at every single day, just all really work together. And our website serves as the home base. So when all these things are kind of working in the background and we're improving them and working on them, consumers are finding us online, right? Through one of these channels or, or maybe all of them. And they're coming to our website, which is our home base. Even if somebody calls our office and says, hey, I heard Taylor on a podcast interview or something. I'm interested in hiring your firm. We actually have a script in our office uh, that our office manager has memorized by now. But she'll say something along the lines of, great, thanks so much for considering our firm. Have you gone to our website yet? Oh, no, I haven't. Why don't you do this? Go to our website, click on that big purple button on, on the you know homepage, read about our process for new clients that are considering our firm. You can actually schedule your first phone call there, or you can give me a call back and I'll help get you on the calendar. So even if they call our office, we're still going to send them back to our website, which means everything funnels back to our homepage and our website. And so that's really where I spend a lot of my time now that we have these five or six things pretty dialed in at this point is how can I create the best possible experience so that when I get so when somebody actually lands there, I'm not missing out on these opportunities. And again, like I've spent over $50,000, multiple agencies, like a lot of time, money and resources have gone into our website. But to me, like it's never done. And even during this pandemic and the world shutting down the last couple of months, I use those two months to work on the, the boring stuff behind the scenes that a lot of people don't really want to work on. I hired a, a user design, a, a UX expert that, again, no experience in our industry at all, that did a website audit, went through and showed me like six or seven things that we could significantly improve to improve the user experience on our website. And so I went through that process. And then I worked with my web team to actually implement those things. And we're just continuing to kind of level up and get better there. So yeah, it all kind of goes back to the website being our home base. And when people land there, we have a very clear process for them to take. And yeah, it's just, it's the, the journey is, has become easier and easier. And so I, I've just got to ask, like now that you're 50 plus thousand dollars into the website, like tips on what we can do if we don't want to spend $50,000 on the journey to try to get to... To where you are, there's some you know learning lesson shortcuts at this point of where to where to focus time or energy to to make the journey a little more expeditious for whoever comes next. Yeah, I mean, again, I think I think simpler is better, right? I mean, you can have a lot of things on internal pages and landing pages, and you can have a lot of fun there. But I think 
you know, for the most part, everyone's going to visit your homepage, right? The homepage is going to be the most visited page. And so again, getting really simple and really clear, we want to have for me, like one single call to action, one thing for somebody to do. There's just too many advisors out there that have five, six, 10 different things they want the consumer to do. And then they're just paralyzed when they land on that website. So it all goes back to identifying exactly what you do and who you do it for, you know, writing that in giant letters over the hero image, having a prominent call to action that follows the user around. Um, you'll see ours is in the the menu that kind of sticks with the user as they scroll down. And it's a totally different color than everything else on our website. So it really stands out. And then most importantly, is just having a clear process. Like, if you really pay attention to yourself and how you make decisions, we just, as human beings, we don't like surprises and we want to know what the process is. And it doesn't need to be a six step process like ours. Our process takes four to six weeks for a potential client to go through. It's long, it's robust. It takes a lot of time, but we've done that on purpose. But at minimum, like if somebody's on your website and they want to work with you, give them some information about what that looks like and what step one, step two, and step three is. One of the mistakes I see a lot of people make is a lot of advisors now have adopted online calendar tools, right? Like Calendly or Acuity. And what they'll do is they'll just put this call to action button front and center on their website that says schedule a call with me. And someone will click that button and it'll go directly to your calendar, right? And there's this middle step where I think most people should have a landing page that explains a little bit more about what that process looks like, what they can expect, what that first step is. If that first step goes well, here's the second step. We even include an FAQ, some frequently asked questions. We try to get ahead of everything that they might be thinking or wondering so that when we have that 15 minute phone call with them, we can really focus on just learning and listening and, and identifying if they're a potential fit or not. I just think having that landing page and getting really clear about that can make a world of a difference rather than sending somebody straight from your homepage, straight to scheduling a phone call with you. Interesting. All, all just built around this recognition. Like as you said, when there, when there's several hundred people a month searching for fee only financial planner in San Diego, like you just have to make these tweaks connect with one or two more people who are like, oh, that extra page was helpful. I'm going to follow through now and actually do that call. You know, one or two more a month is suddenly like 10 or 20 new prospects for the year. Like that material that can move your business just like by making those small incremental improvements to nudge people forward in the process. Yeah. And it works the other way too, where we don't get, it doesn't happen anymore. We don't get people scheduling phone calls that aren't a good fit for our firm because we have these things in place to kind of weed them out. They kind of self weed themselves out by going through that landing page and reading a little bit more about what we're about and what our process looks like and some of the frequently asked questions. So when they actually go to schedule a phone call, they're, they're already, you know, they have all the information that most of their questions have already been answered. So in 2017, I, I sh I've shared these numbers before. In 2017, we had over 100 people schedule introdu introductory phone calls through our website. So over 100 people, so about two a week would schedule phone calls with us. But I think something like only 12% of those actually became clients. And so nowadays, uh, we only get about one per week or about you know 50 per year. So we've been able to kind of weed those people out. And so that's why I think having that landing page can be really important, uh, making sure you're not wasting your time or wasting their time, giving them a little bit more information, preventing somebody from, you know, on a Saturday night, just randomly scheduling a phone call with you, making it a little bit too easy for them. So add, adding some friction to the process can be beneficial. And 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 what does the conversion rate now look like when you're getting these 50 more focused? Yeah, so we've just started to really track that as we've gotten more focus. You know, our our target right now is if they move forward after the initial phone call. So again, we have this this six step process that consists of an introductory phone call plus two office meetings. So if they move forward after the introductory phone call, our target is eighty percent or more will become a client. And so we're just starting to track that. I don't have enough data to say we're you know at eighty percent or higher, but but that's our goal. And if if we're not if 80% of them are not becoming a client after going through that process, then then we're doing something wrong and we have to reevaluate. Well, to me, there's, there's something that's interesting and powerful around, you know, I think step one for a lot of advisors is just like, oh my God, people showing up on my website and hitting a button, scheduling a prospect waiting with me, like that alone sounds awesome. <laughs> I don't have my phone ringing a lot right now. I would like my phone to ring. So the phone ringing, they call me or contact me for, for me sounds good. But then as you've noted, like, if you get that going and suddenly you find you're spending a lot of time with 
people who aren't qualified, you know, just when you, when you lop off 50 prospect calls a year that weren't actually really a good fit that take 15 or 20 minutes for the call and 10 or 15 minutes for prep time and probably cost you another 10 or 15 minutes of just sort of the mental switching of dealing with that. You start adding it up. Like you probably cost yourself 40 hours of productivity through the year by needing to switch off and do that. Like that's a week, right? It's like you make your marketing a little bit more focused. You get a week of vacation back. I I just like to me, it, it gets really powerful. We don't often think about, how much time we we waste with people who just flat out aren't a fit, right? I'm not talking about the, hey, they were a good prospect, but they unfortunately said no. Like you won't necessarily have 100% close rate, nor do I think you want 100% close rate because it's that high, you're, you're probably not stretching yourself enough. You're charging too little or you're giving yourself too many grapefruits. But, but you know, having really low close rates, like I think the industry teaches us, particularly in the early days of cold calling, like, you're just supposed to do the volume and it's a game of numbers and some percentage of them will close. And that's the deal, right? And that's the gig. And we're taught amp up the activity and the results will come. And, you know, there's just this like new world of marketing thing, particularly around the digital realm because of all the ways you can manage the experience and, and, and target it that like you don't have to do marketing that way. In fact, it's technically a horrifically inefficient way to market, you know, we all learn that way because they're paying us on commission. So if 90% of our time is wasted, they don't care because they don't pay for it. <laughs> they only pay for, they only pay you to close. That's, that's the whole, you know, sales based from day one commission model. When you're running a firm and you're running a business and your time is much more valuable than that, that, that old school process that we learn that may be a fine thing for getting started when you have a lot of time and not a lot of clients is really a horrifically inefficient marketing process when you when you get to a certain stage like playing that playing that numbers game that way is no longer a good ROI on your time at all right and but i will say that if you're kind of venturing into this digital marketing landscape and working on generating let's call leads through your website there is a benefit to getting you know, more at bats in the beginning, you know, we learned so much from 2017 when we had over a hundred people scheduling phone calls with us. It gave, gave me the opportunity to really hear what kinds of questions people are asking, what information they want to know, which allowed us to further refine our process, refine our landing page, kind of get ahead of some of those questions, make a note about certain types of people we don't work with. For instance, we don't do hourly planning. We had a lot of people that were scheduling phone calls with us asking about hourly planning. So now we're able to kind of refine our our landing page and answer that question up front so that those people aren't scheduling phone calls anymore. So there's some benefit to getting those at bats and just paying really close attention. Even today, I pay really close attention to every single phone call and say, okay, what went well? What didn't get, go well? How can we improve the process? So there is some benefit there. As you look at this, you know, having been through this journey for the past six years of of being out on your own and and climbing up to to 70 plus million of, of, of assets or management. What's, what surprised you the most about trying to market your own advisory business and build? Well, I think one of the things that surprised me the most, which we've already talked about a little bit is just this, this giant difference between being a financial advisor, financial planner all day long and being a business owner, right? You just, I don't know. I lied to myself, convincing myself that I could do both. And you just get to this point, you learn, I I can't. And so that really was something that really caught me off guard a little bit and really surprised me was just this this huge difference between those two. In terms of of marketing, I think, um, I'm not going to say it surprised me, but I think what I've learned most is that the more personal and vulnerable you can be, the better your results are. I mean, just some of the 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 most engagement we've had are about like emails I've sent out talking about my three-year-old son having his gallbladder removed or the morning of my, my wife was induced with our second son and I was doing a podcast episode, ironically, on 529 plans and college savings. And so the morning before we're go- the morning we're going to the hospital, I recorded the podcast episode at like five in the morning. And I talked about us going to the hospital in a little bit, just like, just got really personal and vulnerable. I think the more you can do that, I talked about those little icons on my homepage, talking about my French bulldog and my love of carne asada burritos and, and my favorite golf course, like all those things work so well. And 
you know, growing up in the wirehouse world and wearing a suit and tie every day and just being really buttoned up and afraid to, afraid to be myself really, I think worked against me. So the more you can just kind of dig deep and put yourself out there and get vulnerable and personal, the more success I think, I think you're going to have. Yeah. I think you make a good point that we, we get trained in this mentality of like always exuding this air of sort of aloof professionalism and that we're not supposed to be too too personal either it's like who knows what other people will think or who knows who you'll offend or like why take the chance let's just keep the professional veneer going when you know on the one hand is as you know like people often connect the most with the personal part and and just at a high level i think you know if if clients didn't want to work with a human being with all the stuff that gets wrapped up in human beings, like they could go actually find technology and automated solution. Like they, they pick working with another human being because we connect with other human beings. So it's, it's okay to be human. Yeah. I was just, I was always so afraid of, of what somebody might think. I, I don't know why. I mean, I don't know if it's just in, embedded in me, you know, my, since I was born or just some of the experience I had in the wirehouse world, but I was just always, I, I know for one thing, for a long time, I was uh, hiding behind my age, right? I didn't want somebody to know that I was 24 years old or 32 years old or whatever. And so that was something that, yeah, I, I hid behind until you know recently. I've just been very okay with sharing how old I am. Yeah, I, like that was a striking one for for me as well. Like similarly, you know, I started straight out of straight out of college. Was very self conscious about my age, not having people know how old I was. It was even for a long time like tried to not like tried to not have much out there about when I graduated, so that people couldn't look up my graduation year and then realize like, that I was still a that was still a twenty something. And like I remember being focused on that, and I remember this point like not that many years ago when like someone had asked me when I graduated, and and my voice kind of caught because that was something I wasn't really used to sharing and had usually kind of held back. And, and had like my brain had to go through this live processing of like, it's okay to say you graduated in 2000. That's now 18 years ago. I was about to turn 40. I was like, it doesn't have the same connotation. Like my head was still stuck in the 15 plus years ago. It was like, don't say when you graduated, because if they can count it was that many years ago on one hand, they're like, they're going to realize you haven't been doing this very long. And 15 to 20 years later, I realized like I was still carrying some of that baggage around of the fear of being perceived as too young when I was a young advisor. Yeah, I, I felt similar ways. I even, you know, uh, I forget the name of the document, the the public document that the consumers can look up their advisor and you know see their their background. And I think it shows your last 10 years of of work history. And on there for a long time, I still had, I worked for early on, I worked for a frozen yogurt company. I could poured frozen yogurt and the name of the company was funny as frozen yogurt. And it was still on my, I was at your U4, your, you know, your, your public thing. Um, and I just couldn't wait for the year that, you know, I, I crossed over and that would disappear <laughs> from, from the database. So yeah, I, I, I hear you. So what was the low point on the journey for you? Oh gosh, I mean, I'm still experiencing low points. Uh, we talked a little bit before we started just some of the challenges we've had this year. I think the the biggest low point was feeling just you know I know other advisors feel this way, just feeling so stuck in uh, that 2016 2017. Like I just didn't, I just couldn't imagine like how I get over this hump. It just felt literally impossible. I just felt so stuck. I felt so out of control. My practice was so chaotic. Clients were all over the place. Everything was a mess. And I just couldn't wrap my head around how in the world I would get over this hump and, you know, kind of reach reach my financial goals. I just I had so much pressure on myself. My wife was was winding down in the corporate world and a lot of, you know, we were having kids and just had this giant financial pressure on me to be successful and, and feed and take care of my family. And it just felt like it was all just kind of crashing down. And, you know, again, just, you know, worked really hard to get over that and had some instrumental people in my life help me. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, you know, owning and operating a business, you're naturally always going to have these low points and these challenges. And we've had a couple of those this year. And I just try to keep my head down and just do the right thing and know we're on a good path and know that, you know, this too shall pass. And so just again, like what, what broke you through this, like, I'm stuck on a, I, I, I'm stuck and I can't even think about how to get over the, 
the hump? Like what was the, what was the breakthrough at the end of the day that, that changed it and said, now I can get through this. Yeah. And I've been through this a few times in, in my career. What I'm really good at is I'm really good at recognizing when I feel stuck or stagnant or I'm not growing. And I think a lot of people will just kind of settle with that feeling and they'll stay at the same, you know, terrible job for 30 years. But I felt that way at the wirehouse. I felt that way when I was at a couple of the independent firms and you know, I felt that way in 2016 and 17, where I just felt like stuck, like just things aren't working. And the one thing that I've always done consistently throughout my career is when I get that feeling and I know something's not working, I know I'm not on the right path, is that I don't let it drag me down. And I go out there and I, I try to find a solution. I put myself out there. And in some cases like this, you know, I spent a lot of money on some great coaches to help me through it. So I, I I don't know what else to say other than like I took action. I worked really, really hard. I had to make a lot of difficult decisions. I had to have a lot of difficult conversations, but ultimately it was just like getting up out of my seat, taking action, not getting down on myself and just, you know, finding a way to work through it really. I, I don't know what else to attribute it to. And, and any coach or coaches that you'd recommend for anyone else who's like hearing this and resonating with the same point of being stuck? Cause just that, that threshold of, you know, two or three hundred thousand dollars of revenue and fifty to one hundred active clients is a is a common while most advisors hit at some point. Just you accumulate enough clients, you will eventually head into that zone, that that wall that a lot of people hit. So, are there particular coaches or people that you would suggest checking out for someone that wants to is feeling this pain as well and wants to figure out how to get through it? Yeah, I, I think always having a coach in your life is super important, whether it's a mindset coach or just a career coach or someone to hold you accountable, whoever that may be. I'm, I always have somebody in my life, in my corner, helping me out because again, it, things are challenging. Yeah, like I said, I, I joined the, the Limitless Advisor Program back in, I guess, 2017 was the very first year. And that was just a, a big game changer for me. It just really opened my eyes to just a whole new world and how to tackle some of these challenges that a lot of us see. So, you know, definitely check out Limitless Advisor, which I know you've, you've spoken a lot here on the podcast and have had a lot of guests who have taken part in that program. So that's been really, really helpful for me. I, I don't know really any of the other coaches outside of that that I could recommend. There's some personal coaches here in San Diego that I've hired, but probably wouldn't resonate with with your audience. So... Anything that you wish you'd done really differently on this journey? Like, what do you, what do you know now that you wish you could go back and tell you from six years ago as you were getting launched with this? You know, there are five or six things in my career that I can point to that attributes to, you know, whatever success I've had up to this point. Um, one of those points, and I, I say this honestly, is coming across you and your blog in 2012 and uh, opening my eyes to you know the the RIA landscape and and you know at the time I think you were just launching XYPN and just like it just set me on a whole different path and just something that I had never you know nothing none of this had ever been talked to me about and what I wish I would have done back then is I wish I would have listened to you and I wish I would have gotten really specific and narrow and identified a niche back in 2012, 2014 and not had to go through all these different iterations and going backwards before I could go forward and having to fire my grandfather and all this stuff. Like I wish I would just listen to you way back then and got really specific, dialed in a niche and just got really focused and didn't get distracted and didn't lie to myself about you know, this client and that client, I just think I would have been so much better off. It would have made my life so much easier. Now I've had some fun going through all those different transitions and iterations. I, I love experimenting. We've tried all these different fee schedules and worked with all these different people, but ultimately I think we'd be a lot further along if I would have just owned this niche on day one, stayed committed to it, kept things simple and just kept my head down and, and listen to, <laughs> listen to Mr. Kitsis. All right. So now I, I, I just got to ask, like going back retrospect is, is there anything I could have said differently <laughs> to, get, to get you on on board? I, I mean, just this this challenge, uh, this fear, I think, is so present for almost every advisor that's thinking about it, right? That just, it's hard not to be attached to the fear of all the people you'll be saying no to when you get focused, rather than seeing all the people that will say yes, because you can connect with them more. Like, is there something that might have helped you? change your approach or get that focus back then? Or did you just have to live this journey at the end of the day? Yeah. I, you know, it's something I think about a lot too, because so many people do are, are challenged with it, especially advisors like myself who, 
you know, they had built up a, you know, a decent clientele. They had, you know, they have 50, 75, a hundred clients and they just can't imagine, you know, having to go backwards and, you know, you know, maybe get rid of some of these clients. So it's a real challenge for somebody in that position who's been working for 10 years and things are all over the place. I, I don't really know, Michael, I, I don't really have the answer other than I think you've done a great job of staying committed to that strategy and, you know, having phenomenal guests on your podcast and talking about their experience. And I just try to try to share that with other advisors. But I think once you, once you try it, and you see the benefit of it, you know, you just kind of this light bulb goes off. And so sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, getting a, a little bit of uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and, and giving it a go and yeah, having some of these hard conversations and making some of these decisions, but it's a tough one. I wish we had a better solution. So maybe you'll tie it into this theme or go, or go another direction. Like what advice would you give to younger, or I'll even say newer advisors, because some are career changers coming in, not necessarily chronologically as young, what, what advice would you give to newer advisors, like getting started and launched today? I think if you can get as clear as possible on who you want to work with, exactly what they look like, right. Their, their age, the, the, the challenges that they have. And then more importantly, I think create like spending time in the early days. This is something like, I wish I would have done years ago, spending time in the early days, creating processes and workflows for everything that you do. I mean, nowadays, every single thing that we do is backed by a workflow or a process, and it just makes things so much easier and it improves the client experience and the value that you're able to deliver. But it just took me so long to just adopt a CRM system. So I know it's fun to go and try all these different marketing things and blog and podcast and you know, have these introductory phone calls and stuff, but I would really encourage new advisors to do that hard work first, you know, pin down these processes and these workflows, build those into your system. They don't need to be robust and perfect on day one, but like lay that foundation so that as you grow and as you kind of get over these different hurdles and you add team members, you can continue to improve and improve and adapt and it just makes your life so much easier. And I know a lot of advisors know that these days, you know, again, in the wirehouse world, we didn't really have CRM systems. It just wasn't something that we were trained on. And I just uh, don't have an operations mindset, but as much as you might hate it. And, you know, one of the things I guess I didn't mention is because I suck so much at operations, I just don't have that mindset. Like we hired an, a, a CRM consultant to help come in and, and shape our CRM system and clean things up and teach us how to build some of these workflows. And, you know, we had her on board for a few months. So you know, if you need to hire someone to help, like, don't be afraid to ask for help. It's so important. And, and out of curiosity, what's your, I guess, what's your CRM system of, of choice at this point? And, and who did you hire to help with it when you needed help? Oh, I knew you were going to ask that. I will dig up her name and, and share it with you. And you can throw it in the show notes. I always draw a blank on her name. But so we were on Juncture Cloud for the longest time. My lead planner is just you know obsessed with workflows. And so they just have a really good workflow system. So we were on Juncture Cloud for a really long time. Juncture has obviously made some changes recently. And they haven't really made as many improvements as I'd like to see. So we went through a whole process of reevaluating a new CRM provider and we just recently jumped over to Redtail. So now we're, we're on Redtail. We're really enjoying it. It's been a really good experience. I'm actually enjoying a CRM that integrates with other software <laughs> and integrates with, with Zapier that allows us to connect to some other platforms as well. So, you know, we went through, uh, you know, quite a bit of research to land on Redtail and we're, we're pretty happy with them. So as we wrap up, this is a podcast about success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is just the word success means different things to different people. And so you're, you've had this great success trajectory building the firm and, and up $76 million in just a couple of years. And so the, the business is, is certainly doing very well now. But I'm wondering, how do you define success for yourself at this point? Yeah, again, I, I, think, I think you're a living and, and breathing example of, of my definition. And to, to me, my definition of, of success is spending time doing the things that that I love and that I'm good at. Also, while inspiring and, and helping other people, I really, I really get a lot of uh, reward out of out of helping other people. When I get an email from somebody else, it's just like thank you so much. Like it just to, to me, like that's that's more than a new client or you know making more money. So yeah, so spending time doing the things that that I love and that I'm good at. If I can find a way just to do more and more of that every single day. If the, for the rest of my life. That's success to me. Well, I love it. I love it. I, I appreciate you joining us to share the story around it. And again, for folks that are interested, I do encourage everyone like check out Taylor has a podcast. He goes into 
all like even more detail about all of the like successes and foibles of experimenting and advisor marketing. It's literally called the Experiments in Advisor Marketing podcast. You know, I, I enjoy listening to the episodes. So really appreciate Taylor your 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 willingness to share both in, in your podcasts and and joining us here on ours. Thanks so much, Michael. I had a lot of fun today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.